This webinar is originating from the city of Vancouver, which is founded on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Speakers may also be presenting from other locations. Hello, my name is Sophie King. I am the manager of professional learning at PIBC, and I'm very happy to welcome you to Ethics and Professionalism for Planners, something we can use in every profession, actually. This webinar is being recorded and a link to both the recording and the slide presentation will be emailed to you shortly after the webinar. If you have questions during any of the presentations, please type them in the chat window located to the lower right hand corner of your screen. Um, however, if um, you want to send us a question anonymously, please wait until the Q&A portion of the program. If your question is easily answered, um, the presenter will try and answer it right away. However, um, we will reserve all questions, more in-depth questions, to the end. If you would like to, um, sorry, I just need to log in a few more people here. Right. So I, I think we will begin now. Our presenters today are Patricia Maloney with uh, Patricia Maloney Consulting, Vancouver Island University, the PIBC Board of Directors from 2019 to 2023. And Patricia also serves on the PSB Board of Directors 2023 to the present. We have James Stiver from Metro Vancouver, who is also on the PIBC Professional Conduct Review Committee, and Alex B. Taylor, who is with the City of Vancouver and the PIBC Professional Conduct Review Committee Chair, and who also sits on the PIBC Board of Directors, um, who's been on the board for a long time, as you can see from 2019. Um, and whose term ends in 2025. So we have a very uh, distinguished panel um, to hear from today. And without further ado, I will ask Patricia to turn on her webcam and her mic, and we will begin our presentation. Hi, Patricia. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, and welcome everyone. Um, as Sophie said, we have three presenters today uh, and uh, we do want to recognize and acknowledge and appreciate that we are all able to work and live and learn on the traditional lands of BC and Yukon First Nations and Indigenous people. Acknowledging the principles of truth and reconciliation, we recognize and respect the history, languages and cultures of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit and all the Indigenous people of Canada whose presence presence continues to enrich our lives and this country. I'm coming to you from the traditional and unceded territory of this new name of First Nation in Nanaimo. So in this presentation today, um, and I see we have a terrific attendance and thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take a look at the importance of ethics in the planning profession, the code of ethics and professional conduct, ethical issues faced by planners, case studies using real life scenarios, and then a little history of some of the ethical complaints to PIBC. I think that um, it, it's, we are using real case, real, real life cases, because we want you to know that, uh, that this is something that we do face, unfortunately, ethical challenges uh, on a day to day basis. Uh, we will be doing polling. When we get to the case studies, uh, we will be asking you to vote on what you think is the right answer. So there will be polling as we get down there. Um, it's not a specific software you you pull just by using uh, the webinar and uh, and your device. So why ethics? Well, um, ethics are basically the backbone of of what planning is. Uh, we all come from varied backgrounds, but we need to have the same ethical requirements to function as professional planners in Canada. Uh, professional characteristics uh, include the education, the completing the exam process, the logging the work experience, uh, completing continuous learning in our code, but it, it's also about how we approach people, how we approach uh, uh, the, the issues that we're dealing with. 
so what we're looking at is the ethical standards and accountability, which are key elements that distinguish professionals from non-professionals. And planners are recognized for ensuring the public interest is protected. And we work towards um, uh, ensuring equitable and sustainable communities and, and processes. And when we talk about the public interest, I always say we used to call this the greater public good. The public interest is all of public interest, not individual public interest, which is something that often trips up our, our newer planners. Uh, the greater public good or the public interest is what we're working for. As planners, all we have is our reputation. It's critical to act ethically and with integrity. Uh, we need to be recognized for the work in establishing sustainable and equitable communities and to earn the confidence and the respect of the communities uh, that we serve. If we don't have their confidence, if we don't have their trust, it's very difficult for us to do our jobs. So philosophically, um, the, the moral foundation uh, for, for our ethics, um, I mean, there's a whole philosophical field of, of ethics, but what guides our decision making uh, is the fundamental to the fundamental questions is about what's morally right or wrong, just or unjust, uh, good or bad, and to consider the ethical implications of our actions, ensuring that planning initiatives align with uh, uh, justice and social well-being. We talk about value identification and Planning involves making choices that affect individuals and communities and the environment. Um, we engage, we, we must engage to be ethical in a reflective self-examination and evaluate our own beliefs, values, and actions. And while we all have our own beliefs, values, and actions, we can't necessarily um, inflict those on our communities. We need to understand what the core values of the community are. Conflicts are quite common in every profession and planning generally involves balancing these uh, interests, these differing interests uh, with ethical reasoning. Planners navigate these complexities by providing a systematic and, and we look at the different values, interests and perspectives. So everything we do is to balance all of the different interests. I was saying the public interest, but there are many other interests, individual interests that, that combine to make that. And it's our job to balance those, to come up with a recommendation that would be applicable to the community. Ethical decision-making is, is something that we look at all the time. The, the moral considerations um, that take into account the principles, the consequences, the rights of people and different perspectives. Uh, PIBC has actually been quite a champion of what we call JEDI, uh, justice, equality, diversity, decolonization, and inclusion. I got them all. So we are we make all of our decisions based on that, which comes into the social justice and to look at the social inequities, uh, such as spatial segregation, uh, inequitable access to resources, and how we promote social justice by creating more inclusive and equitable communities. And that is something that planners can have an impact on. And that is something that we need to, to consider in all of our decisions. Um, public accountability is critical. Planning decisions have far reaching consequences for society, both in the short and the long term. Now, while many of us don't actually make the decisions, we provide the information and make the recommendations to the decision makers. And so it's very important that we ensure in all of our work and recommendations that we are ensuring transparency, inclusivity, um, and make sure that we have addressed the aspirations for each community. So the code of ethics and professional conduct is, is the sort of the guiding document for our ethics. There is a national code of ethics um, adopted by the Canadian Institute of Planners. Um, and, and then there's the code of professional conduct, 
also adopted by the Canadian Institute of Planners. However, each local planning institute or association has their own. They can vary slightly, but they must meet the core elements of the national. And it's critical that we do that so that we have you know, transportability uh, across the country for planners. Uh, the code of ethics makes sure that planning members will use their skill set and knowledge uh, for better. <laughs> we sound a bit like uh, uh, we, we're we're always looking to do the best thing, and sometimes that's a bit difficult. We need to use that for the benefit of this, of society. The code of professional conduct provides consistency across Canada, and the code forms the basis for the planning practice of our members. So the concepts within the Code of Ethics include competency and integrity. Competency is your knowledge um, and skills needed to practice in planning. We must be able to apply that knowledge successfully. We also must never um, uh, operate in areas outside of our expert area of expertise, and we must uh, continually upgrade our knowledge and understanding of uh, the skills and the practice. In terms of the integrity, integrity, it means having a keen sense of responsibilities to the planning profession, employees, and sense of independence to exercise professional judgment independently without bias. We all know that we have biases. There's unconscious bias. We understand those are there. We need to, as planners, uh, look beyond our personal and look at the greater public good and look at the community. We have our statement of values, and these are very important too. We, we need to respect and integrate the needs of future generations. We need to overcome or compensate for jurisdictional limitations. We need to value the natural and cultural environment. We need to recognize and react positively to uncertainty. But the one thing that is certain is uncertainty. We need to respect diversity, we need to balance the needs of communities and individuals, and we need to foster public participation. Finally, we need to articulate and communicate values. And one of the things that planners do well is communicate both verbally uh, and in written form and make sure that what we're communicating is understandable. So we apply these values in our work and communicating uh, the importance with clients and employers. The code of professional conduct is broken down into three areas. The planner's responsibility to the public interest is probably the, the key one that we're looking at. This is our, our main purpose. Then we look at the planner's responsibility to the client or the employer. And thirdly, we look at the planner's responsibility to uh, the profession, actually. So the planner's responsibility to the public interest, we need to look at the diversity, the needs, the values, the aspirations of the public and encourage discussion on these matters. And this is where we come to balance. We come to balance all of those individual interests. So whether it's a cycling group, an environmental group, a downtown businessman's group, we're looking to balance all of their concerns to identify what is the public interest. We need to provide clear and accurate information on planning matters uh, to the members of public in a timely manner while recognizing employers' right to confidentiality. Always, uh, it, it can be, particularly if you're in the private sector, it can be uh, um, a delicate balance to know what can be made public and what can't be with the understanding that transparency is, is critical to our profession. We need to acknowledge the interrelated nature of the planning decisions, and we need to provide opportunities for meaningful participation. I think the key word there, as we all know, is meaningful participation and education in the planning process to all interested parties. The planner's responsibility to clients and employers is also critical. As I said, we, we are often the the, the researchers and the makers of recommendations were not always the decision makers. And so it's really important, important that the clients and the employers, we have a responsibility to them. Uh, we have to always give them our independent professional opinion, work within our area of professional competence, work with integrity, undertake services with diligence and preparedness, uh, acknowledge the values held by the employer 
and or client in the work that's performed. Respect the right to confidentiality unless it conflicts with aspects of the code. Um, uh, and this is something that could be a much more detailed conversation. Um, inform the client and the employer in a timely matter of potential conflict. Uh, conflicts arise between either yourself or the employer or the client. Um, not offer or accept any financial inducements that could appear to influence or affect professional opportunities or planning advice. I think that we all are fairly aware that the concept of bribes has, has gone uh, even to a well-placed bottle of wine, uh, which could be completely inappropriate given the circumstances. And we only work for one employer on any particular planning issue at any one time. That doesn't mean that you can't moonlight. It means that your responsibility to that employer and their work cannot conflict with anything else that you are doing. And the planner's responsibility to the profession. This is where we look at, at what it is that we do, what we give back, um, how we get involved, uh, how we continuously learn. So we need to update our own knowledge about planning philosophy, theory, and practice. So this is why we have uh, CPLs that we have to log. We do not engage in dishonorable conduct. We do not advertise or attempt to uh, complete services outside of our competency. We always act fairly and not falsely injure the professional reputation of another member or their work. Uh, we try not to take other people's jobs or contracts. Uh, and one of the things is we do not sign off on work unless we have thoroughly vetted that and checked that to make sure that it is correct. Uh, we report unethical and unprofessional behavior. We do not make public statements on behalf of the Institute unless authorized to. We comply with the Institute's request for information and cooperation, and we respect processes and decisions by any review or disciplinary process of the organization. So these are the basic foundation, the building blocks to our ethics uh, and professionalism. We, we only have we only have our own profession, our own um, reputation to guide us through. Uh, continuous learning is always critical. And I think that the, the one thing that we need to always understand is that our key client is the greater public interest and, and how we can benefit that. I'm going to turn now over to... Uh, our next speaker, who is going to start to look at some of the case studies. So I'm turning this over to James, and James will uh, continue our uh, seminar. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, yeah, so uh, carrying on uh, the conversation a little bit, let's, uh, let's have a, a bit more of a talk about ethical planning issues and the key ones that we see today. Um, Planning in today's world is faced with multitude challenges. Our world's getting far more complicated day by day. Uh, and there are certain real world challenges that planners commonly face. And this can include plagiarism, equity, transparency, and accountability. So let's, uh, let's explore these ones a little deeper. And it's not meant to be an exclusive list, but uh, these do tend to be the key ones that, uh, uh, that challenge us. So in terms of plagiarism, <clears throat> Plagiarism is defined as using another person's idea, results, process, or words, and passing it off as one's own without crediting the original source. That is the key uh, piece there, that latter bit. It's a serious breach of professional misconduct in our profession. Uh, people plagiarize as a result of not being aware or knowing any better of, uh, of the source of uh, material that they are, are using perhaps for, from pressure, perhaps from a lack of confidence in their own abilities to uh, articulate ideas or concepts in a certain way. Uh, work might be perceived as too difficult or out of scope of, uh, of their area of expertise, or it could even be driven by a lack of interest or laziness in the work, uh, which uh, uh, none of which is a, a justification for uh, the use uh, or practice of plagiarism. Uh, and this could in, uh, include, include correspondence or public documents. So 
how to avoid uh, plagiarism, actually, before we move on there, how to avoid uh, these pitfalls. Uh, the obvious one is quote the source uh, of, of the, uh, the, the language that you're using, giving credit to that source. Citing the source creates a trail that others can follow in your work and dive deeper into topics that, uh, that may be of interest to them. Uh, paraphrasing the work of others is an easy way to avoid plagiarism, but it's important to cite the source uh, uh, of an idea that may not be uh, common knowledge, but is not necessarily uh, quoted. Uh, the use of common knowledge that is not attributable to one person or a researcher or a project uh, or information about famous people in their work or current events, none of that would be considered plagiarism uh, or the results of uh, planning processes being come, becoming public and available is also a good way to avoid uh, um, uh, being accused or, or a victim of uh, plagiarism. So now let's, uh, let's uh, talk a, about a simple case study on the issue of plagiarism that might help people visualize uh, this in, in a real world context. Planning consultant A is hired to update a community's official community plan. After community engagement, it's been determined that many of the original policies are still applicable and should remain in a new updated draft OCP. Council gives first reading of a new OCP. A week later, planning consultant A receives a call from the original planning consultant accusing the current consultant of plagiarism because of the work that was copied and brought forward. What's the best next step for the planning consultant that is currently working on this project. A, to apologize and give credit to the original planning consultant, consultant B. Uh, B, do nothing. Once it's adopted, the OCP belongs to the municipality. C, tell consultant uh, B, the work is yours now and they are out of luck. Or D, request that council establish ownership of the document. I'll pause there, giving people a chance to vote. Okay, um, I think everybody, uh, most people are on the right track. Uh, the correct answer is B, do nothing. Once it's adopted, the OCP belongs to the municipality. It's never wrong to, uh, to thank a previous consultant for their innovative and genius work. But in this particular example, an OCP is uh, a, a property of the municipality that adopted it. Following this example, uh, once a consultant prepares documents for a municipality and it's been accepted and adopted, the documents become public property, property of that municipality, not the original consultant. Most RFPs at municipalities issues state this in uh, clearly in the, uh, um, in the contract for work and that the product becomes a property of the municipality to do with what they wish. Therefore, if a municipality hires a different consultant to do an update or revise the adopted document in the future, gives a new consultant, uh, they typically give the new consultant permission to change, modify, use the content uh, as part of their work, and it's their right to give that permission uh, to copy or, or edit materials. In fact, most municipalities do not maintain a consultant's name on adopted documents for this reason, to be very clear, uh, the ownership. So uh, the new consultant or consultant A in this case would not be plagiarizing the original consultant's work if they keep some of the original wording. So uh, the second uh, common uh, uh, challenge that we face as a profession is around the area of equity. Equity has been in question for many years, uh, but it's becoming regularly more a part of our planning conversations. Cities have been dealing for decades with issues like gaps between wealthy and poor neighborhoods, for example, uh, people that have different uh, uh, degrees of privilege that allow them to engage or not engage in public processes, and the impacts of colonial-based assumptions and practices on certain members of the community. Health, income, mobility, and other inequalities tend to be institutionalized over time and reflected in historic uh, policies and practices, and in some cases have been shown to disproportionately limit opportunities to specific groups based on race, age, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, religion, disability, or other areas. 
often people of color or members of equity seeking groups can't see themselves reflected uh, as a result and feel detached and challenged to engage in community planning. Fundamentally, the planning profession, uh, profession is driven to create a better community for all. And this goes back to Pat's uh, uh, discussion about the public interests and what they are. We collaborate daily with many other professionals to deliver inclusive, resilient, and sustainable communities. So we do have an obligation to recognize this. While a great deal of effort in the, in the planning profession focuses on identifying and addressing inequalities in cities, there is limited research on those inequalities within the field of planning itself. Planning profession in Canada is still limited in terms of racial and cultural diversity, which can make it challenging to appreciate and incorporate the lived experience of, uh, experiences of racialized communities in the city building process. This can also result in unintended consequences of our work. Planners need to be sensitive to this and seek out opportunities to build up more diverse connections with members of a community and within the profession itself. For example, this can be seen in grassroots organizations taking the lead, such as food banks, places of worship, First Nation communities, other nonprofit, non-governmental organizations who partner to compete, uh, complete affordable housing projects to meet a community's needs that have been identified by perhaps their members. So now a simple case study to explore this issue of equity a little bit deeper. A municipal planner is conducting engagement for an OCP review. One of the primary directives for the OCP is to increase residential infill, very common theme these days. During the engagement process, there are, there are strong oppositions from the residents of one particular neighborhood. What's the planner's best approach here? A, prepare the staff report noting the opposition group's comments. B, prepare the staff report that provides a summary of all engagement. C, prepare the staff report not including the comments of the interest group. Or D, prepare the staff report and write recommendations to reflect the interests that, that reflect the interest group. I'll give you a moment to uh, consider your answer and make a selection. Okay, people seem to be moving along here. Okay, voting seems to have slowed down. The correct answer is in fact B. I see we have 100% agreement. Wow, I don't think that I've ever seen that happen. Prepare the staff report that provides a summary of all engagement. And again, uh, this shouldn't be a surprise to professionals. Uh, who have been considering what the public interest is and how we represent our communities and the diverse voices. It may seem obvious, but all engagement must be heard and recorded. Uh, however, it is a professional planner's job to filter that engagement, ensuring that the, the, uh, that the voices are heard by the decision makers and give an adequate weight. It's also uh, essential for professional planners to make recommendations using best practices following direction from your council or the decision makers while serving the public interest. It's not one single public interest. Okay, so um, another example uh, to consider on the issue of equity in the public interest a municipal planners conducting engagement for an OCP review. The engagement was advertised in the local newspaper and on social media. One neighborhood has a very high percentage of recent immigrants, and there was a very low attendance from this community during the engagement process. What's the best action for the planner that's leading this part of the, the project? A, assume that group was not interested in the work. B, create policies that might reflect their views. C, conduct more engagement using translation and translators, or D, request a spokesperson from the community attend the meeting. So I'll pause there for a moment. You see the choices pop up.
Okay. Voting looks like it's slowing down again. So the correct answer is C, conduct more engagement using translation and translators. The importance in, uh, of inclusionary engagement is to be fair to all residents of the community. The original engagement program did not provide fair equal opportunity for those residents of this neighborhood to participate by not providing any materials in the language most used by the residents, which could have resulted in a barrier to their participation. Recent uh, 2021 census results have demonstrated that languages other than English and French are increasingly being spoken as primary household languages in our communities. And we as a profession much re must recognize the changing nature of our community by providing those translation, translators, and culturally appropriate means of engaging all residents. It's important for us to recognize our community and the characteristics of it and how they change over time. Every community will be a little different. Best solution here is to be sensitive to those needs and the, and the barriers to participation and hold another round of engagement using translated materials, if you have the resources available, obviously, that better reflect the community's makeup and provide translators at any public or virtual engagement sessions to, to assist those to feel part of the process and, and share their, uh, their thoughts and comments. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Alex, who's our next speaker of the presentation. Thanks so much, James. And great to see so many people with us today. Great to see such an interest in ethics and professional conduct. <clears throat> going to our next slide, we are going to jump into the third kind of category of major challenges that planners face when it comes to professional conduct and ethics, transportation, trans transparency, and accountability. So planners are often at the front lines of controversial community development debates. Being transparent in our communications, especially around public engagement, is essential to maintaining trust among all those we have responsibilities to. Pat and James have talked about a number of those groups, but it includes our employers, our clients, applicants, public officials, and of course, members of the public from a wide variety of communities. We must always act in the public interest and our code provides principles that establish ethical guidelines aimed to ensuring public confidence in the integrity of the planning process. And lastly, social media is a great way to disseminate information in real time and engage community members who might not otherwise attend meetings or participate in government in person, but it also must be used responsibly. So we're gonna jump into our fourth case study here. This relates to professionalism. And here's the scenario. You were out for dinner and you overhear someone who you recognize as another registered professional planner saying very derogatory comments about another RPP. What do you do? Do you A, ignore it and attribute it to happy hour? Do you lean over? Alex, for some reason, we're unable to hear you. Can you try turning your microphone on and off? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, did it just drop off at some point during that slide? Yes, for some reason, I'm not sure why. Okay. Maybe begin again with the case study. Begin again this slide, okay, with the case study, yeah. okay. Apologies everyone, technology is great. So our, our fourth study relates to professional and here's the scenario. You were out for dinner and you overhear someone who you recognize as another registered professional planner saying very derogatory things about another RPP. What do you do? Do you ignore it and chalk it up to happy hour? 
Do you lean over and tell the planner to stop? Do you go to the next table and ask to speak with the planner privately? Or do you D, report the incident the next morning to PIBC? I'll give you folks a moment to vote on what you would do in this scenario. Looks like most folks are thinking C or D. Give me another moment there. Yeah, this one's certainly not unanimous, which is great. So we have something to talk about. I'll end the poll there. So in this situation, the right answer is C. You should go to the next table and ask to speak to the planner privately. And you might ask why. So all PIBC members are bound by the code to treat each other with respect, which means not slandering other planners. And we also have responsibility to report any other members we see breaking the code to PIBC. However, in this case, it would be good practice to speak to that member privately, note that you felt they were breaking the code, and pro first provide them an opportunity to acknowledge it, apologize, and take it right. So C is the right first answer. However, if the alleged offender is abusive or refuses to apologize or recognize that they were speaking inappropriately, then that is when you would select D, and that's when you could contact PIBC, who would refer it to the Professional Conduct Review Committee, aka the PCRC. If there's any questions on that, we'll get to that uh, at the end here. <clears throat> So that brings us to our fifth and final case study for today. Scenario is the planning solving is submitting an application for purpose-built rental. The application conforms to the OCP and the housing policies. Through engagement, it seems the community generally supports it. The file manner plan the file manager Alex, I think we've lost uh, the audio again. Maybe try turning your microphone on and off one more time. Is it? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, it's a little rocky, but uh, it will do. I'll stop with my earphones. Let's try this. <clears throat> Can you still hear me? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Great, thanks. Sorry, sorry, folks. So this scenario, uh, the file manager decides to ask for additional reports, push the application off agenda, and it takes an extremely long time to review materials. So if you were the planning consultant acting on behalf of the applicant in this scenario, what would you do? Would you politely provide the requested reports and request a council date? Would you schedule a meeting with the local councillors to complain about the process? Would you C, seek a meeting with the director of planning to review the process? Or D, place a complaint of, of obstruction and unprofessionalism to PIBC? And we'll open the poll here and see what folks think in this one. Looks like everything, almost everyone's thinking the same thing here. 95% for answer C. A few other, a few other thoughts here. Yeah, there, definitely, this is a really interesting scenario. On the poll there. So in this case, uh, what we would recommend is seeking a meeting with the director of planning to review the process. So uh, answer uh, number, answer C. Um, based on the fact so far, one can't be 100% sure that the delays are intentional. And the final manager is certainly completely within the right to request information they feel is required to fully understand the impact of the proposed development. If, if you were to bring it up with the, plan, with the planning director, it provides an opportunity to discuss it with someone other than the file manager. And if it appears that the municipal planner 
is indeed placing unnecessary roadblocks in the way due to personal preferences. The director has an opportunity to intervene in the process. However, in this case, if the director takes no action, and then it does become certainly clear that the planner is obstructing the process, the consultant or developer here could make a complaint to the IBC's Professional Conduct Review Committee, and that would be investigated. So who can actually file a complaint? Uh, we've talked previously about uh, members being able to file a complaint, but really anyone can file a complaint against a PIBC member for allegedly breaking the code of ethics and professional conduct. That includes fellow members, members of the public, developers, and elected officials. Formal complaints that are received by PIBC are forwarded to the PCRC, which is comprised of 14 volunteer PIBC members currently, uh, who have a variety of experience and backgrounds. As chair, I then appoint two case officers to conduct an initial investigation of the complaint. The subject member is informed about the complaint and is required requested to respond to that complaint with their side of the story. And after a thorough review of the complaint, the evidence provided, the, the formal response by the subject member, and the relevant aspects of the code, the case officers make a recommendation in a formal formal report to the PCRC chair for review and signing off. Some, and in those cases, no further action is required. However, some do find that there was indeed a breach of the code. And in, that, in those cases, the next step is to propose the consent discipline process. And if that fails, or in some cases of serious breaches of the code, a review hearing is held. The timeline for this process can certainly vary, and it depends on the complexity of the complaint, the number of parties involved, the time required to gather information, and the time required for communication back and forth with the complaint, complainant and the subject matter, uh, subject matter rather. But this is usually in, in formal letters and emails. Some investigations can take several months and dozens of hours of time from our case officers. Each year, PIBC fields dozens of inquiries related to prof professional conduct and ethics, and some of them turn into formal complaints. From 2012 to 2021, PIBC received 13 formal complaints of alleged professional misconduct against PIBC members. Nine of those were lodged by members of the public, and four were lodged by PIBC members against other members. Eleven of those uh, subject members worked in the public sector and two worked in the private sector. The since 2021 has certainly been busier than the 10 year average of about one to two per year. Uh, in 2022, uh, we received five formal complaints. And in 2023, so far, we've also received uh, another five complaints. We've had uh, a few committee veterans step down from the committee after many, many years of service. And earlier this year, we welcomed six new members to the committee. And you probably saw that our call for volunteers uh, earlier in the year. Beyond investigating formal complaints, uh, PIBC, PCRC members, so the committee members, do a variety of other things, including developing and delivering professional learning for members on ethics and professional conduct topics through things like webinars, like we are doing today, through other uh, conference sessions and through articles in Planning West and, uh, and other uh, industry uh, publications. We also assist with general inquiries and review policies, processes, and we also develop issues and practices in the area of professional discipline. The committee meets uh, twice a year, and we also periodically review and recommend updates to 2016 when both CIP and PIBC updated their, their codes. There are four general topics for the types of company. Most of them fall through, fall in one of these categories. Uh, the majority, so over the past 10 years, 69% related to 
the general handling of a planning process or development approval process. Uh, we often have uh, complaints from applicants that they didn't agree with the decision and, and lodge a, a complaint. In some cases, it's, it stops the inquiry uh, stage, but sometimes we do need to investigate uh, into those complaints. 15% uh, relate, were related to a lack of integrity or professionalism and undertaking planning services with diligence and appropriate preparation. Uh, the third category there, uh, we had one over the past location of skills offered and only doing work within areas of competence. Pat talked about that in our code of ethics and professional conduct, only doing work in those areas where you have competence. And the last category here related to the handling of or the signing off of planning documents or drawings. So of those 13 cases, uh, in 12 of those cases, there was found to be no breach of the code and one of the did result in a full formal review hearing and consent discipline action as it was a serious breach of the code of the 10 cases over the past two years a few are still being investigated uh, but like the previous decade many were found to not actually be a breach of the code but did require uh, investigation from case officers and there has been one over the past two years that did result in consent and discipline. And so that pretty much brings us to our Q&A uh, prepared slides today. I think Matt and James will be happy to join me for a question and answer period. We do yes, have one slide you, that will save to the end that we can talk about resources to keep folks updated. So over to Thank Sophie. you very much, Alex. Um, sincere apologies for the sound issues. Alex, you, you started off really, really well. And halfway through, um, something happened with the sound. But we, we got the gist of it, so not to worry. Uh, Pat and James, please turn on your mics and your webcams and join us here. And uh, before we begin our Q&A, I just have uh, some instruction, some instructions for our viewers. If you would like to ask a question where everyone can see your name and um, the question, please type it in the chat window as normal. However, if you would like to ask um, a question anonymously, please uh, send it to myself. So um, click on the host button and type your question there and I will read the question out, okay? So if it's anonymous, send it to the host. If you don't mind ev for everyone to see your question and your name, please type it in the chat. So we will begin with a question, um, just going back about plagiarism that I saw earlier. Um, I can't see where it is, but it was, mm -hmm. is AI plagiarism? Mm -hmm. And this is interesting because our last webinar uh, about a week ago, it was on AI and um, ethics and equity and all that. So I'm curious to find out your um, opinion. Maybe we'll start with Pat. <laughs> we, have, we have yet to really um, establish a lot of policies about AI. Uh, I think that AI uh, can be a great tool for research. I don't think it's considered plagiarism. I stand to be corrected, but I don't think it's considered plagiarism because it uses a number of publicly accessible sources. Um, uh, my, my comment would be that while AI might be good for research and helping put together some basic things, uh, it doesn't have the humanity that we have to uh, consider a lot of the other components of planning that we need to to look at the public interest but I do not believe it's considered plagiarism thank you Pat uh, James or Alex would one uh, of you like to comment sure, I'll maybe a brief comment uh, this is a new world for all of us uh, I, I would tend to agree with Pat that it's not a person so it's not plagiarism and the the source for the the data uh, behind it is all public anyway uh, but, you know, it, uh, it does raise a bit of a specter of laziness and professionalism uh, if you're relying heavily on somebody else to do your work. 
Uh, there's an element of creativity that we have to bring into our work. Uh, and our job is about synthesizing information and inputs from many different sources. If AI is one of those sources, I think that's completely fine. But it has to be your own work at the end of the day. If your name is on it, you stand behind it. As professionals, uh, we need to be producing our own work. And um, if this helps get you started, uh, that's fine. But it can't be the, uh, the end goal, uh, in my opinion. Alex, would you like to comment? Yeah, I'll just add on that. Uh, apologies for, for any audio challenges, folks. You sound much um, better now. OK, that's great. Didn't do anything different. but. Um, I, yes, I know PIBC had a webinar on this uh, last week or two weeks ago. I, I unfortunately was unable to make it, but I know they, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there were some likely very healthy discussions on AI and use in our, in our work. Um, there's certainly challenges with things like chat GPT that grabs things from all over the internet. Um, some of them are, you know, publicly. I guess adopted documents by local, regional, provincial, federal governments, which are you know public documents and other things could be you know research pieces uh, that do have authors and are owned by by a variety of uh, sources out there, and ch things like ChatGPT do not you know source those, uh, cite them, and so following that trail that that James was talking about uh, is certainly difficult. I have heard and and I think for those reasons. Some many municipalities have not jumped really into that world, but I have heard of, some, of other municipalities who have used AI uh, internally. So it doesn't search from from the whole wide internet, but it, it searches from their internal documents, all council, you know, everything on their their internet per se, mm -hmm. and can pull things from a variety of of different internal sources. If that's the case, there's no citation needed. They're all you know city or town documents, etc. Um, so that is, I think, a, a very valid use of, of AI so far that has been, uh, I don't know, proven to be legitimate, but is starting to be more legitimized out there. Uh, but it's certainly a, you know, a, a cutting edge challenge. And our, our code of ethics and professional conduct does not touch on AI at all. And that's probably one of those areas where we're likely to want to update it. A lot of things have, have changed since 2016 beyond just AI. So that's why it's healthy to, to maintain that and review it and keep it up to date. Great question. Great. Thank you, Alex. One of uh, the ethical issues that our speaker brought up uh, last week during the, that webinar was that if you're using a, a AI, um, it is based on language that's already out there and you may be perpetuating inequalities because mm. of you're using the existing language. So that was uh, something very interesting. And then Annie Dempster here is asking, what type of AI are we talking about? Language model AI or search model AI? I don't know what the difference is, but the lawyer, um, the law professor did talk about that. And her point on that was that you have to be very clear on what type of AI you are using because they, they uh, have different results. So that's a point there. Um, Sam Lauren, if we use another municipality's policies when rewriting our own documents, do we need to credit that municipality in the approved policy? That's a good question. Who would like to handle that? James, you're you're nodding. Well, I, I could start us off. No, I, I uh, <clears throat> just thinking back to university days, I think we all fall victim of stealing other people's work because there's no sense in starting from the first rung on a ladder, but uh, there's a lot of good ideas out there. And I think we all at some point borrow from other places uh, to build on uh, ideas and, and try and land them in, within a local context. Uh, I, I My opinion is um, uh, I don't think you need to uh, source uh, information or policy language from uh, another OCP. Uh, definitely you, you need to tailor it for your own context. Uh, it becomes very obvious when, especially uh, if you don't change the name of the municipality, which I have seen in some uh, uh, rather uh, cheap consultants work, but I'm not gonna go any further on that. But you know, you need to make it your own, but ideas in general are not attributable uh, once they're in the public realm. But as a courtesy, if you're using somebody's uh, material as a direct quote, 
Uh, I have often seen reports that say, hey, you know, here's some great examples of an approach. For example, the city of Vancouver does this in their OCP and you do a direct quote, that is uh, completely appropriate, right? To give them the credit for that. If you are developing your own policy, uh, you're considering several, many different inputs to that. Uh, that's probably less of an issue there. But definitely if you have something like a table or a map or something, uh, credit should definitely be given to the person or organization that produced that as, as a source, uh, because that is uh, uh, like a clip and paste of, of uh, work that was developed by that organization. But I'll Great, pat thank, on. thank you, James. Patricia or Alex, would you like to add anything more? That was quite a detailed answer. I think James yeah, I think covered James it. Really great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions for our panel? Well, your presentation was very thorough. <laughs> That's great. Sophie, can you can you remind people how they can uh, submit a, an anonymous question? To submit an anonymous question, please um, send a chat to me, to the host. So click on the host button and, and write your question there and not everyone will see it. So right now we have everyone, but uh, if you want to send a uh, anonymous question, click on the host and you will be sending the question straight to me. So, so you click on the plus sign beside where it says everywhere and it comes up host. Host, yeah. I see Brian Chow is typing. Sophie, can I just say one thing while Brian is typing? Of course. Um, one of the things that I've experienced over years is that often people think that a planner who works in the private sector has a different set of a different code of ethics than a planner who works in the public sector. And I'd like to be very clear that we all have the same code of ethics. We all fall under the same direction and guidelines, whether you're private sector or public sector, whether you're working for a municipality, the federal government, or a land developer, uh, it's always the same ethics. The public interest, the responsibility to your employer or client, and responsibility uh, to the profession. That doesn't change public or private. That's a good point, Patricia. Okay, Brian has submitted his question. When a consultant consultant drops off a Christmas basket for the planning department, how should a planner handle this gift? <laughs> um, how about we go to Alex? Yeah, great question. I, I'll certainly take a stab at this and can pass it over to others. Uh, having worked at a number of local and regional governments, many have policies around gifts and things like this. I've seen uh you know dollar amounts of anything less than 25 dollars doesn't need to be registered or reported in in a system um for something like this where it's it's dropped off uh you know presumably at the front counter um as long as that is shared with the entire municipal staff uh i've seen that that you know it's not an issue it's not uh, uh a gift given to a single person as long as it's shared internally i think there are also uh other municipalities out there who have clear complaint or clear policies that for something larger than, uh, you know, a box of chocolates, the polite thing is to, to say no. And I, I've seen that as well. So I think it does really depend on um, uh, the, the, where the organization uh, ethically, I think um, within the code, uh, there's nothing that, that speaks specifically to, to gifts other than like blatant bribes. But I think for things, uh, in my experience, dropped off at the front counter, they're not directed at a specific person. And so it's it's really difficult to uh, to see anything wrong with, with small things like that. Pat, would you like to add anything? I think, um, uh, and this is certainly topical. I mean, us, us older types remember some of the um, gifts that were given many years ago. Um, there was research done in the United States of the medical profession that demonstrated that uh, a $20 free lunch was enough to influence um, how they wrote prescriptions. And this was in, in, in response to the opioid crisis. So uh, I think, I think your best um, 
option is to always err on the side of non-acceptance of anything. But if it is dropped off at the front reception, take it into the lunchroom, open it up, everybody shares it, or raffle it off and take the money and give it to the food bank or something, you know, but, but an individual uh, it should not be accepting anything. James, nothing more to add. Uh, I had a planner from Portland do a web webinar for us, a lovely person. And to thank him, I sent him a bunch of Starbucks coupons because I know they work in the States. And uh, shortly thereafter, he sent me a photo and he said, yes, this is me taking my staff out for a coffee break. So I thought that was a wonderful way of handling that situation. Okay, uh, back to your point, Patricia, um, when you talked mm -hmm. about uh, working for the public planners, working for the public sector or private sector, what happens when um, plan a planner is not a member of PIBC? <laughs> They're not required to follow our code of conduct. Um, one would hope that they act professionally and one would hope that they follow the basic rules of engagement but um uh that is that is one of the i suppose concerns is that they're not if they're not a member of PIBC or CIP or another affiliate they are not actually required to uh, to follow that code of of conduct we have no um ethics review we have no uh control over how they operate what if they're a planner and an architect or are not a plan. They're a planner, but they don't belong to our organization. But they do plan, uh, belong to the architectural institute. Then, then they would follow the architect's code of of conduct and code of ethics. If they are, if they are not, if they are um, a planner by profession or planner by education and not a member, we cannot control or dictate uh, their code of conduct. Okay. Thank you. Um, Can I add to that? Of Sophie? course, James. Uh, I, uh, I, I've seen examples of, of uh, uh, people using the term planners, and maybe it's a job title uh, that, that's been given to them. Uh, there is a risk there for the Institute, and uh, uh, because of conduct um, uh, that, that they follow, uh, can reflect badly on members, because the public doesn't necessarily make the distinction between those that have an RPP and those that don't if the term planner is used. So there is a risk. But I just wanted to add that uh, I often tell uh, young planners that I'm mentoring that that's one of the benefits of PIBC, PIBC membership is the use of RPP demonstrates that you adhere to a code of ethics. You've, uh, uh, you've uh, agreed to a set of standards of professional learning that we uh, have to demonstrate annually. Uh, so there is like there is a standard there that exists uh, beyond non-planners, so that uh, that that is a strength of our profession to mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, to have these obligations. But again, there there's that uh, uh, um, misconception sometimes of what an RPP is versus uh, others that are just using the term. So there's that risk. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. I have a question that was submitted anonymously. If you work for a private EC developer for for a First Nation, is it unethical to do work for the chief at their request that is for their personal benefit? Oh, if, if you work for a private economic development for a First Nation. Yeah, so that one is tricky. Who would like to mm. tackle that one? Mm, not sure I understand all, this, all the specifics, but if you are, so you you work for a firm that's doing economic work for the nation okay. and the the chief asks you to do additional work for him her yes him? and it says here the uh ec develop uh ec dev is owned by the first nations and the economic development corp is owned by the first nations so if you do work for a private economic development corporation for a first nation mm -hmm. is it ethical unethical to do work for the chief at their request that is for their personal benefit it 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 may not be but but until you have a little more detail if if the if the chief of the first nation is asking you to help them with um maybe getting a grant to 
get the mold out of their house. You know, there, there would probably be no ethical um, conflict. If the chief is asking you to help them um, uh, start a business that might be in conflict with the uh, objectives of the economic development strategy, it could be. But let, let me make this very clear. It's no different if it's a chief and a First Nation or if it's a mayor and a town council. Um, because we run into the same kind of um, uh, potential conflict with municipal councillors and and uh, mayors of, of communities who might be asking uh, the, the planner to do things, help them subdivide a piece of land, for example, that might not actually conform to the OCP that you might be working on. So so it's while it's it's I, I hate to say that ethics can be situational, but you, we would need to know more details about this one to understand if this was truly unethical or, or whether it was um, a situation that was perfectly fine. Uh, and so I think that's, that's the answer I give is be very clear when you are asked to do work that you think there's a conflict and be aware that there's also perceived conflict. So there's a real pecuniary interest conflict where you're making money or getting some kind of a benefit. But there's also the perceived conflict that, for example, the example given, the other First Nation members may feel that you are completely out of line uh, helping the chief with his personal issue, uh, even though it might not be an actual conflict. So again, discretion is a better part of valor valor and sometimes you just need to say no i can't i can't do that and i will find someone else to help you with that project okay so uh the person has further clarified the request is to remove land from the alr not on reserve to help with the application process and develop potential development option that sounds a little controversial to me it's it's very controversial, but and 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 to improve development options again is is and is the and we can't get into all these details. But the things to ask yourself is: Is the chief actually acting for his own personal interest to do development there, or is he actually doing something that would benefit the members of the nation? So so there's a there's a there's a lot of nuance there, and I appreciate the. Um, difficulty with that. If whoever has written that question would like to discuss it further, I'd be happy to have the conversation offline. Thank you, Patricia. And I, I like your analogy of um, mayor and council. It's the same thing. Yeah. Whether it's First Nations, chief or mayor and council. Um, okay. Going back, Br Brian yeah. Hart. Okay. Oh, sorry, if Alex. I can just, if I can just add to that, I think, I think our, our ethics uh, session at the conference this past summer. Um, Phil Buholzer uh, paired up there and presented a really great section on on conflict of interest. Um, if you are, I'm, I'm assuming most folks here are, are POEC members. Uh, I believe that would be posted on on the portal at some point. Um, but the main the main piece with conflict of interest, it's not so much if it is actually a conflict of interest. It's the perceived conflict of interest. If there's any way that someone could perceive there to be a conflict of interest, that's as bad as it being a conflict of interest. And so um, I, I think that's just a, a point I wanted to make. And certainly uh, PIBC fields a lot of inquiries from folks wanting to know uh, specifics around questions like this. So it uh, sounds like Pat is very willing to feel it, very willing to feel the question. Uh, I would certainly recommend that you uh, could have a chat with the PIBC office and provide a bit more details and get a bit uh, more formal of, of an opinion on that. Pat, I will forward this person's email to you and you can contact them privately. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Brian Hart has pointed out that both architects and planners are required to act in the public interest as mm -hmm. a fundamental core value. Good point, Brian. Um, Alex, you responded. There's a question yeah, so, coming. Yeah. Did you so want I, to elaborate? I just, uh, yeah, I just pasted a couple sections there from the code. Uh, if you Google PIBC Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct, uh, you'll find it there. It's on the PIBC website. It's a four-page document. I wouldn't, you can feel free to sleep with it under your pillow if you like. 
but it's certainly <laughs> very good to refresh yourself with that at least once a year. Um, in our in our final slide here, we we do have a number of other resources that I'll just uh, I can go through quickly before we sign off. But let's let's uh, continue with the questions at this point. Okay, if a planner receives consultant advice that an initiative contains significant adverse impacts, such as a policy plan, but leadership does not want to inform decision makers about the advice, what is the responsibility of the planner? Yeah, and, and this is not uncommon. Um, the reality of our profession is we all answer to somebody and uh, we all uh, have an obligation to our employer to the public interest and many other things, professionalism. But there's structures in our organizations that we work for that often come into play and it's our job. Uh, our job as planners are not is not as a decision maker in any context. It's, a, it's advisor, no matter how, uh, um, uh, how we're employed or who we're working for. So I would say in this particular example, um, best efforts to explain uh, positive and negative outcomes of, of different options is our obligation as a professional in this case. Um, uh, I often tell younger planners uh, um, uh, authorship of reports is often a controversial issue that mm -hmm. that uh, that we should take uh, seriously as a as professionals. That if you do not feel comfortable with the content of a staff report that has something in there that has not uh, uh, provided the uh, adverse impacts you're talking about or the recommendation is not something you support, you should never put your name on that report and you should make it very clear to your supervisor that please take my name off that report and put your name or somebody else's name on it who supports that. Mm -hmm. uh, don't ever put yourself in a situation where you your name is associated with something you don't agree with because that stays with you. So that that is the solution in that case. That doesn't solve the issue but the decision of a supervisor or a manager taking something to a decision maker is out of your hands. Uh, you could make best efforts to try and convince them and uh, um, to take a different path, but at the end of the day, um, it's your job. But the, the, the authorship of, of reports or correspondence uh, is really your, your tool to step out of a bad situation you don't feel comfortable with and, and uh, let the process play out. Thank you, James. Pat, would you like to add anything? No, I think James covered that. I see another question coming in, um, which is the flip side of it, as as okay. Shannon says. Okay, so. Alex, anything more on that question? No, no, James did a great job. Yeah, nothing okay. out there. Okay, so we'll go back to the, the flip side of this. How to handle a senior planner director who takes credit for your work? Hmm. I, I can I I'll jump in there. Um, I think it, in some ways, it sounds like they they are also an RPP. So you're both bound by the code of ethics and professional conduct. So I, I would frankly have have a, a conversation um, about that specific piece and uh, around the plagiarism piece um, and or you know, just in a working working relationship uh, discussion, whether or not it it actually is a breach of the code depends, you know, if they, uh, you know, co copy language or whatever. Um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of different variables. But personally, I would have a conversation, open it up just in terms of working relationship, you can get into the code of ethics, because uh, many people, as I've as I've mentioned, it's great to refresh it every year. I you know, especially as chair of the PCRC, I find myself referring back to the code monthly, if not more often. It's, you know, it's four pages long. We, many of us studied it when we did our exams to become an RPP, but there's a lot of people who had kind of forgotten about it and haven't looked at it in five years. And honestly, mm -hmm. every time you have another look at it, you get reminded, oh yeah, oh yeah. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it's really important to, to remind yourself of that. Uh, regularly so and and colleagues as well so over pat. pat the 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 other thing too is that in many municipalities um 
it's it's the director of planning or the CAO who signs all staff reports and 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 the, the actual planner's name doesn't get on things at least that's what I've I've seen from from many municipalities um, and and often um, uh, good ideas are um, desired by other people uh, and I don't I don't know that I don't know if that's an ethical thing or if that's just a hierarchy thing uh, but if if someone is taking credit for your work, um, there's, in, in most cases, there's not much you can do about it except continue to work and continue to give them great ideas. <laughs> That's positive. James, anything to <laughs> add? No? Okay. Shirley is asking, she mm -hmm. says she noticed an RFP for the ethics online course. How will this impact those of us who are in the process of accreditation? Pat, did you want to? I, I can speak to that. The uh, the ethics online exam um, has been the same exam for, mm, I don't know, uh, ever. And, and we, the uh, uh, professional examination and education committee of PSB has put out a request for proposals to write a new exam. It won't affect you at all. If you want to, if you, if you're in the process now and you want to take that exam, go ahead and take the exam. Everything that's in the study guide is related to the current exam. Um, and I don't, because I don't know when the, the next, when the upgraded exam will be available. It might not be for a year or 18 months. So if you're in the accreditation process and you're ready, you can write the current exam uh, using the materials in the study guide and work towards them writing the professional exam. And it, it, it won't slow you down or stop you at all. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, how do you manage power dynamics while following the code? I talking to the other planner first, but it puts you at risk. So same uh, theme. Yeah, um, I'll, just, I'll just comment. Briefly on that, certainly, you know, interpersonal relationships at work definitely in play, power, different levels of employment, etc. cetera. Um, when it does come down to the code, if you're both members and you can't get any progress um, in a discussion one-on-one -on -one around the code, around things making you feel uncomfortable, things being un unprofessional, there is the, you know, Members are bound to report other members who are not following the code of ethics and professional conduct. I'm not recommending you lodge a complaint against your boss per se, but that is certainly, uh, you know, an avenue that the code prescribes is a possibility. And so um, I think it very much depends on on the situation, how, uh, how dedicated you are to maintaining that employment with that organization, with those, with those people. Um, you know, it's a small industry, but there are other roles out there. I have seen people quit jobs because of being requested to breach the code, etc. There's, I've also seen folks who want to keep their job and uh, have, have, you know, entered into some gray areas. So it's, Thanks. it's certainly a yeah, personal, personal decision um, and certainly not one taken lightly. And certainly we would recommend you get professional advice. Uh, initially from PIBC and and also from you know folks who might be your mentors in in your career, and also you can you can uh, through PIBC office uh, engage with some folks on the professional conduct review committee who may have more experience on these types of scenarios in these cases. Thank you, Alex. Would anybody else like to add anything more to that topic? No. Maybe just quickly, um, I just reiterate that it's important to protect yourself. Uh, and if uh, 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 if you're in that situation, um, do the best you can to protect your integrity and not be uh, uh, sucked up into something else. Uh, of course, there's always going to be power struggles, but the risk piece uh, puts you in a very vulnerable position if you don't want to lose your job. But do the best you can to protect you from any potential uh, blowback that comes from uh, a violation of ethics. Thank you, James. City of Delta, for a planner living and working in the yeah. same community, what is the appropriate level of involvement in a development proposal located near your home? Shall we go to James again? Sure, this is also fairly common. Um, 
I, I think there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, being an involved citizen in your community, especially if uh, it has a direct impact on you and your family. Uh, your knowledge can help your neighbors uh, make better decisions. I think that's a great thing and lead conversations. Uh, the problem uh, comes about when it starts to conflict with your work. If a particular development proposal is on your desk at work and you're participating as a resident, that's that's where the conflict starts to arise. Um, if you have the opportunity, uh, you can declare a conflict with your boss and just say, I respectfully request not to work on this particular amendment or development proposal because it's in my neighborhood. Uh, I think that gives you uh, the opportunity to uh, comment on it as a resident. Uh, again, uh, Alex raised this a, a minute ago. There is a perception of um, uh, ethical breaches that you just need to be conscious of. Because if you are standing in front of your council uh, who employs you and uh, you're uh, beating the podium and uh, screaming uh, about shadows and traffic, as we all like to hear, um, and that can put you at risk with your employer. So please be cautious uh, with that approach. Uh, but uh, I think ethically, uh, if, as long as you're not working on an approval or perceived as having an influence on the outcome of that approval that has a direct impact on you, I think you're in a, a, a good spot. Thank you, James. Pat, would you like to add anything? <laughs> No, I mean, it, it is a difficult situation. And of course, the smaller the community, the more visible you are in the community. Um, but you you do have you do have rights um, if if you live in a in an area where a proposal is going to impact you. Maybe it's how you choose to provide your input. Maybe it's a letter from yourself and your partner. Maybe it's um you know, an email to the, the, the planner, but James is absolutely right. If this is your file, you, you have to, you have to declare a conflict um, and get and moved off uh, this, this project uh, because you do have perceived or not perceived. You have a very personal interest in what's happening there. Um, and it does happen. And don't, if it does happen to you, don't think, Oh my gosh, I'm the only person that's ever happened to it. It happens to lots and lots of planners. So, so if you do, if you do have a conflict um, uh, that you're working on the file in your neighborhood, express that um, at, at least, at least make sure that your supervisor is aware of it. And the supervisor can then make a decision on whether you stay on the file or not. But how you participate as a as a resident, you can do it in a mm, uh, respectful manner. And, uh, but if, if it's your file, it's really difficult. So there's a, there's a point where you have to, um, declare a conflict. Good point, Pat. Alex. There are a lot of planners, especially capital regional districts, Metro Vancouver, who choose to live in a different municipality than they work for very good reasons. And avoidance of this completely is one of those reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not saying you need to move it's you can't plan a city from your desk you need to be in the community you need to living there is the best way to experience the community so you can you know engage with the stakeholders the residents know the community yourself but that is a very challenging place to be um, especially in small communities where uh, you know as planners we're supposed to be neutral but when you pull into um, into that picture where you live and your, you know, your neighborhood, your community, your block. Um, we're all humans, and it's just human nature to uh, have those unconscious biases, and those can seep in, and they will seep in, no matter how neutral you try to stay. And so, uh, avoiding that perceived conflict of interest is key to protecting yourself, and 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 just not having to deal with with that at all. So, and, and can I add an additional complexity to this that uh, that is very common? is uh, people in your community know you work for a municipality. They know you're a planner. They see you with your kid at the soccer field or the hockey rink, and they want to talk to you about a development and share all their thoughts and try and influence you. Uh, there's also a problem there as well. So uh, the perception of that you can be influenced or cornered uh, at the library on your day off mm -hmm. um, is a very common thing. Um, and it's a challenging minefield to navigate. But again, you don't want any perception that uh, this property owner has come to you in off hours to try and influence you. 
uh, real or not, uh, people watch, and especially a community, everybody knows what's going on, and there's that mm -hmm. risk as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think a lot of teachers like to live and work in different municipalities for <laughs> very similar reasons. Yeah. Um, okay, so I see we're nearing the one thirty mark. Um, why don't we call it call it a day? I am going to go to this final slide here and turn my webcam on so I can Sophie, see can I, can I just quickly go through that final slide that we had of the resources? If you can't bring of it up, course. that's okay. Yeah, I, no, I can do it verbally. I can do it. No problem. I mean, just give me CIP a moment. And, and PIBC have a wide variety of resources uh, that can keep you up to speed on ethics and professional conduct. Yeah, there we go. There. Okay. Um, so CIP has their uh, code of professional conduct, which is, as Pat mentioned, is the minimum standard for provincial and territorial institutes and associations, which we refer to lovingly as PATIAs. Uh, you should review that each year. Uh, the PIBC Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct is uh, the code that, that planners and, and RPPs in BC and Yukon uh, need to abide by. Today's webinar is the first in what we're expecting to be an annual session. Uh, which each member will need to tune into a minimum of once every three years uh, for their CPL credits and to maintain membership. So we're testing that out. Um, give us feedback on this session. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, there's also national and provincial conferences and webinars, other national associations or organizations. You know, APA has a has a bunch of stuff. Their code of conduct is was updated a couple of years ago, and it's fantastic. Um, and books and articles as well. So lots of resources uh, and certainly drop myself an email or a phone call. I'm sure Pat James and others uh, that have been involved in the PIBC board, Professional Conduct Review Committee are would be happy to uh, have a conversation at any point. So thanks again, everyone for coming. Thanks, Alex. Yes, we will um, be emailing your contact information to everyone watching today, along with the webinar recording link and the slide presentation. So if you want to uh, watch the webinar again, that would be very useful. Um, if you've watched it now, please remember to uh, log 1.5 units. And I will 1.5 CPL units for, for watching today. And we will also put the webinar recording on the PIBC YouTube channel, as well as the resource page of our uh, website. So a lot of different options to get information. Oh. Um, so I, I would like to thank our speakers again, Patricia Maloney, or Pat, James Stiver, and Alex Taylor for their um, very informative presentation. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a lot, and I hope you did as well. And um, that concludes our, our webinar. Thank you again. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.